Good morning. Let's open up in prayer on this beautiful day. God, we thank you that we could come into this house of worship together with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and pray and worship and open your word, Lord. Just pray that you would meet us right here, right where we are. Lord, just pray that you would help us to grow and draw closer to you today. Lord, we pray that you be honored with our worship and our singing this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Those who are able, let's stand and sing together. Everybody has trials and temptations. Everybody knows heartbreak, isolation. But we can lay our burdens down. Lay our burdens down. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon, and forever and ever, His heart is my home. Everybody has fears, everybody's got worries. Everybody knows sorrow, devastation. But we can lay our burdens down. Oh, we can lay our burdens down. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon, and forever and ever, his heart is my home. No more betrayal, for he is faithful, he fills me up and my cup runneth over. No more betrayal, for he is faithful, how he has proven it over. Over, no more betrayal, for he is faithful. He fills me up and my cup runneth over. No more betrayal, for he is faithful. How he has proven it over and over, over and over. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon. And forever and ever, his heart is my home. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon. And forever his heart is my home forever and ever his heart is my home amen What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since 
Jesus came into my heart. Wells of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure. Since Jesus came into my heart. No dark clouds of doubt, now my pathway obscure, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Oh, since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll. All right, let's let's pray together as we come to our time of prayer. And please remember, I think everybody had heard that uh, Jesse Wooden passed away. Uh, email was sent out, but just pray for Mona and their other kid, as she was just less than two weeks behind Woody's passing. Um, so. If you guys have something on your heart you want to pray for, you have a couple minutes to think about it. If there's something you want to bring before the Lord, and everybody will be praying for you and along with you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have every Sunday, just to be able to lift up our requests before you with one another, Lord. It's always encouraging to have a whole church full of people praying for you and lifting each other up before you, just like Moses had men that gathered around him and helped him to hold up his staff during the battle as his arms got tired. Thank you that we do have each other for that. Thank you that we could give all of our requests to you, but there's nothing too small that you don't care about or nothing too big that you can't handle. Lord, this morning, just want to lift up the wooden family to you. Lord, and Mona, just pray that you bring them comfort. Their, their kids, as both of their parents have passed within a short time. Lord, just pray that you would draw near to them. Just fill them with your presence. And Lord, just want to pray over our church. Lord, that... Uh, just pray for all those having health problems, that uh, you just give them the health to be able to be here for those who want to come. Or just want to pray over our city, Lord. Just pray that people, more and more people's hearts would turn to you, Lord, that need you and need to know your love. Lord, just pray that we could be a good, a good witness here and a bright light in Lincoln and in the surrounding towns. And now I'd like to open up the request to the congregation. Lord, we thank you for hearing all of our prayers. Lord, we thank you for the many answered prayers that we see. Lord, just just pray that as we give these to you, that we have the peace that comes from putting things into your hands. Lord, I just pray that you would just continually remind us to turn to you 
rather than trying to have our human tendencies to fix everything on our own and do things in our own strength and in our own power or because our own power is so small compared to what what you've done and what you can do or just pray that you grow our faith pray all this in jesus name amen <laughs> And again, we continue the worship in the Thank 
I had watched some of a documentary of a man that was documenting his experiences in prison. And he, you know, first he was arrested and went to jail. And jail is just for shorter term lockup. But then when you have a sentence, you go to prison for the long haul, which is a whole different ball game than jail. Because you're in there with hardened criminals and some rougher people. And usually people on the way in worry about their own safety. So this man was describing his first day in prison, you know, the bus ride there and taking it all in. He said he was brought to the wing where he was assigned to a cell and they gave him a cell number and said, you know, go on down to cell 23. And he just terrified walking over there, making his way over. Is this cell 23? And he said there was a enormous man that was there in the cell that was to be his bunk mate. And the man, is this 23? Yes, this, this is. Said, oh, I'm, I'm assigned to it. He said, hold it right there before you come in. I have a question for you. What are you in for? And he said, I'm in for attempted murder. The man said, well, that's respectable. You may come in. That, that, that's respectable. So we're looking at the parable of the dishonest manager today. And this is, this is probably the hardest of Jesus' parables. And it's often been misinterpreted and misunderstood. So it is a difficult one of Jesus choosing to use the example of a crook. So you'll see shortly how the prison example ties into that. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, and we could stop right there as the previous several sections, Jesus had been addressing the Pharisees. And so his attention turned, his teaching turns from rebuking the Pharisees and parables to make some of the Pharisees see the errors of their way to a lesson to, for his disciples. There was a rich man. So here we have a rich man. And then Jesus gives some explanation, does some teaching. And then there's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus down later in the chapter that starts the same way. There was a rich man. So both of these are dealing with our wealth, possessions, and resources. So Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Doesn't, doesn't tell us how, but he's squandering the man's wealth. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give me account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. So we don't know if this man was, how he was wasting it if he was taking something off the top for himself, if the accounting didn't add up. It's an age-old story. That, that happens. You have to be really, really careful about who handles your money if you have other people doing it. This is given account because you cannot be my manager any longer. Long story short, you're fired. He loses, he loses his job. But an interesting detail of this is that it was not effective immediately. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. If you've ever lost a job, been laid off, that's what's next. 
when you lose your income, it's scary to wonder how it is you're going to make it and survive and provide for yourself or your family if you have one. My master is taking away my job. So he starts weighing his options. I'm not strong enough to dig. Well, he it's not clear if he doesn't want to do manual labor, if he's too old, if he has a disability. Not everybody's able to get out there and dig and do hard labor. So he says, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I do, when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So the next part of the story shows us why. Sometimes when people are fired, it is effective immediately. It's pack your boxes and security will escort you out. Why do they do that? Well, sometimes because people can do some damage or play some get-back games if, if they aren't let go immediately, if there's some kind of impropriety that's going on, as, as there had been here. So here, an urgent decision is required. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? Um, 900, 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The biblical unit in the time was 900 baths, or bathos, which is approximately a gallon, so that's that's a lot, 900, 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. I mean, what is, what's a gallon of olive oil cost at the grocery store? 30, 40 bucks, more if it's high end, or flavored or dipping oil. So the manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. So he cuts it in half. Then, then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told them, take your bill and make it 800. It's always interesting when you are authorized to negotiate on behalf of your company or somebody else. It's a fine line. I had worked with the property management company where I was tasked with getting new, bringing new accounts under management, finding apartment buildings to manage. And so there were norms as to what percentages were usually charged of the gross rents and income collected. And they wanted accounts. So I had a lot of uh, liberty to be able to negotiate the price. Um, they want new accounts, so sometimes if you're dealing with somebody that's a tough negotiator, you have to know how low you could go and how good the account is in order to bring in the business. But if you go too low, you're not making any money and the owner's not real happy with you. So. It's, it sounds like that type of scenario where he has the authority to be able to negotiate with the, the clients or the people that owe money. Verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. So the master, it seems, was... Oh, a bit of a dishonest guy himself. So he's out committing usury, which is charging high interest to other people. 
you know, an exorbitant interest amount to other people and probably ripping other people off and he in turn gets ripped off or swindled and rather than being angry and yelling at this manager or doing, doing something, he says, the master commended the dishonest manager for he had acted shrewdly. It seems a case here of the swindler got swindled and says to the guy who swindled him, well played. Like, I taught you well. I mean, this guy was his, this guy, the, the manager may have been his protege, but he taught him everything he learned. And he's saying like, man, good thinking, good job there. He can appreciate this man's wickedness, even though it's at his own expense, because he himself is wicked. Now, this parable is hard to interpret for a number of reasons here. The master commended the dishonest manager for his dishonesty. Now, in most of the parables, it's a bit easier. Usually the master is God. Usually the father in the story is God. Usually the bridegroom is the Lord. So, here we have a dishonest manager, I mean a dishonest master, commending the dishonest manager for his wickedness. So, thus, the master cannot be God. So, we have to take a step back and say, what, it, what does this parable mean? Jesus explains it a little bit more in the verses ahead. But, Jesus was telling a story just like the big, hardened cellmate that said, what are you in for? Well, attempted murder. Well, that's respectable. It's like one criminal is appreciating the crime of another, saying, well, that's respectable. You see, there are, I've heard there are crimes in prison that are not respectable. People that uh, seem to be social lepers in prison, people that have harmed children, for instance, are social outcasts in prison. Um, corrupt police officers are big social outcasts in prison, and sometimes they need to put these people in their own areas or in isolation for their own protective for their own protection so that they don't get killed. But the deal here is one crook appreciating the crime of another. And in this parable, even though it had been turned around and inflicted upon him. Now, being able to, being able to, uh, reduce the debt here, it was against the law, both um, both civil law and religious law to charge interest. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 19 says, and they were under the law at this time when Jesus was teaching, do not charge a fellow Israelite interest whether on money or food or anything else that may earn interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, but not a fellow Israelite, so the Lord your God may bless you in everything you put your hand to in the land that you are entering to possess. And even, even the church at times has forbid usury, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, which was a very important church council um, because they looked at many of the Christian early writings and made a definitive once and for all list as to which ones are, com 
are considered scripture, inspired by God, God's holy word, and which of some of the early books were not trustworthy. And while they may have been good Christian writing in some cases, or good Jewish writings in others, that they were not considered the word of God. And that's what the council is remembered for. But they made this other decree as well. For as much as many enrolled among the clergy following covetousness and lust of gain have forgotten the divine scripture which says he has not given his money upon usury from Ezekiel chapter 8 and, lent, and in lending money ask the hundredth sum of monthly interest that would be 1%. The holy and great synod thinks it's just that after this decree anyone be found to receive usury, whether he accomplish it by secret transaction or otherwise, as by demanding the whole and one half, or by using any other contrivance, whatever, for filthy lucre's sake, he shall be deposed from the clergy, and his name shall be stricken from the list. So, it was in Christian times for forbidding the uh, collecting of interest. Now, back to, back to this parable in ways that it's interpreted. Um, the first interpretive option is that the manager had cheated his master out of the money due him by reducing his debt, in which he had the legal authority to do so before his termination became effective. So he cheats his master by reducing, reducing the debts of the people that owed him bushels of wheat and gallons of olive oil. The second interpretive option was that he had a change of heart and did the right thing, excluding the interest, which was illegal anyway, that they were charging illegal interest. And so he did away with the interest, thus repenting of both of their sins, in a sense. Um, there is a Catholic commentary that had this explanation of that he just uh, did away with the interest, which was illegal anyway, thus having a change of heart. A uh, third option was that he reduced the debt by giving up his own commission. That, that was charged there in order to have the other parties owe him a favor. But, verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. So, the master is commending his dishonesty, or appreciating his dishonesty, not his righteousness, not his change of heart. So, more of the commentaries, and I would, I tend to agree with it, that number one, that he was cheating the master because he had been, the text says, commended for his dishonesty. Now, what do we do with this parable? Later part of verse 8 here. It says, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So, in beginning to interpret this parable told of two crooks or two swindlers, the manager, the unrighteous manager, the dishonest manager, sometimes called the, the shrewd manager, sees that, well, he's about to be 
out on the street. Po possibly the master gave him a place to live, a salary, food. So he's about to be out of a job and he's about to be homeless and an, an urgent decision is required as to what is he going to do. So he decides in favor of what most people would decide, which is self-preservation. Now, everybody wants to preserve themselves, and that's not unique to human beings. That's a commonality among all life. Everything that's alive wants to keep living. If you've ever had a fly in the house, and you're chasing it around with the fly swatter, well, it's trying to avoid the fly swatter. Why? Because its brain is the size of a speck, but it wants to live. Everything wants to live. You hunt something, it's trying to get away from you because it wants to live. You see a scary, hairy spider crawling around on the floor, and you're, you, can't, you know you can't sleep with that in your house and you're trying to get it, well, it's running away. Why is it running away? Because it wants to live. It wants to preserve itself. So here Jesus is using, using the example of eternal life. Now, all of us, the Bible teaches everybody, has had some dishonesty in their lives. We've all had some sin. We've all had things we aren't proud of. And the Bible tells us that we will stand before the throne of God and be required to give an account. And Jesus is saying even, even the dishonest choose to preserve themselves. You know, when, when it comes time for an accounting, he has an urgent decision of how am I going to make it through this? So he decides self-preservation, even though what he's doing is unethical and probably illegal at the time. Now, each one of us have a rather urgent decision to make as well. When we're called to stand before God, and give an account, what's that going to look like? For a lot of us, that's intimidating and doesn't look very good. Now, Jesus says, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are people of the light. People of the light are a term for the righteous and godly people. And then he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So Jesus is saying, use your resources to pursue eternal life. Now that's not saying, you. it might sound like you can buy your way into heaven, but the rest of scripture, we interpret scripture by looking at it as a whole. You can't, you can't do that, it doesn't work that way. But Jesus is telling us, secure your eternal security. Get your spiritual life squared away. Get right before God. You see, he's using the example of, hey, even the crooks want to get their, uh, even this crook, this dishonest manager, gets his affairs in order when he sees that his time is coming near, so that after this job, when he moves into retirement, these other people bound by honor will owe him a favor. He will then, at least for the short term, have somewhere to stay and not be out there sleeping on the sidewalk or under the bridge. Now, 
Jesus is saying this in light of, so that you will be welcomed into eternal dwelling. So this is a come to Jesus call. A, if, hey, if even the wicked people can get their affairs in order to be able to preserve themselves in the hereafter, you get your affairs in order, get right with God, come to Jesus, accept the forgiveness that he's offering to you so that you too may have eternal life, so that you are not out on the street, so to speak, in hell because your sins are not forgiven. Now, this is this is a very, very unusual parable. Hard, hard to interpret here as we have one crook praising another crook. So the master thus is not God in this parable. But it's like saying, what are you in for? Yeah, that's respectable. It's a sort of do what you've got to do to survive story. And it does deal with wealth and resources that it opens. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. And then Jesus saying, use your resources, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwelling. That's a sort of don't just use your possession on your possessions and your wealth on your own pleasures and on yourself, but use it for godly purposes as well. Use it. Use it to evangelize. You want to go to heaven by yourself? Or do you want your friends and family to go with you? Yeah, of course we want to all go to our eternal dwellings with people that we know, love, and care about. And if we really do care about them, we care about their eternal destiny and security as well. Um, it was Charles Spurgeon, the great English preacher in the 1800s that said, if you don't care about the salvation of others, you're probably not really saved yourself. There, there was a Seinfeld episode where Elaine was dating David Putty, if you watch the show, and he was a born-again Christian. But he was dating her that didn't believe in God, and it started to bother her and said, she asked him and said, do, do you believe that I'm going to hell? Well, yeah. Well, why are you not trying to convert me? Don't you care? He said, well, that's your business. That's your business. That's a, that's a private matter. That's between you and God. I don't, I don't really care. Well, if you think I'm going to hell, that should bother you. Why doesn't that bother you? And that was, that was kind of the premise of the episode. But you know what? They nailed it. They nailed it as a lot of people just kind of don't seem to care about the salvation of other people. Yet, we have here the, this dishonest master with a dishonest manager. You know, it's, it's fine if they're out swindling people. This is just such a strange thing in the Bible. It's like the master's fine if they're out swindling people together, but you swindle me, you have to go. It's a sort of mafia-like ethic. You know, like we can, we can be thugs and we can rip other people off, but you, you rip us off, it's your time to go, right? And Jesus is pointing out this self-preservation, which is a rather funny thing to be pointed out, is most of us don't come to Jesus in the first place and don't come to God because 
we love God and we're holy. No, it's because God reaches out to us when we're a sinner, and we tend to accept that because we want our sins forgiven, usually for selfish reasons. It's like the thief on the cross. He had nothing to offer Jesus, and he was probably afraid as he's up there dying of what's going to happen to me. Where am I going to go? But what did Jesus say to him when he said, Remember me in parrot? Remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus says, Surely this day you will be with me in paradise. We, we come to God as wretched sinners. And God, that's our justification in theological terms. And, then our, and that happens in an instant where our sins are forgiven when we repent and we turn to Jesus and make him Lord of our lives. But then there's our sanctifications where we go from being wretched sinners to holy and godly people, which is a long process, a lifelong process. The sanctification is our process of being made holy. Yet, I believe he's pointing out that we usually come to Jesus because we're, we see that we are in need of salvation. And then we learn to love God. And then we start learning what holy living is all about as the Holy Spirit forms us closer and closer into the image of Jesus Christ. Then Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will you trust with true riches? Jesus is reminding them, hey, even if you're not even if you're not rich, even if you have very little, it matters to God what you do with the little you have. For whoever has been faithful with little will be given more. And any who is unfaithful with the little that you have, that will be taken away from you and you'll be you'll be given less, given less. So he's saying, if you're trustworthy with what God has given you, you'll be given more. But if you're not trustworthy with it, verse 12, and if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And saying God cares what we do with our resources and with what he's given to us. And he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the, despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. King James puts it, I believe, as you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon meaning worldly wealth or worldly things. You have to... You have to make a decision. A lot of people spend their life believing the purpose of it is to accumulate wealth. Well, I'm going to tell you, you were created for a lot more than just to pay bills and die. God, God has more for you than that. But he reminds us, you can't serve both God and money. Of course, we have to pay the rent or the mortgage and eat and we need money to survive but one one has to one has to be your priority one has to have your first allegiance you can't really serve god and anything else remember the first commandment of the 10 commandments what is it no other gods before me that means god's supposed to come first in our lives the pharisees Jesus turns his teaching to the disciples in chapter 16, but the Pharisees are still there listening and hanging around. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value is highly detestable 
in God's sight. That means a lot of the worldly success that people are running after don't impress God and don't matter to God. That's worth repeating. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. A lot of our definitions of worldly success, God's not impressed, God doesn't care about that, and in fact, if that's your purpose for being and what you're running after and your number one priority in life is highly detestable in God's sight. And that's a strong word. What do you, what do you detest? Think about like what food can you absolutely not stand to be around? You know, it's, it's one thing if, you know, if somebody says, uh, you know, boy, you know, I, I really don't like tuna, but, you know, I'll, I'll eat it in a survival situation. I like tuna, by the way. I'm just using an example. If somebody says, like, man, I, I don't like tuna, but I'll eat it if that's all there is, that's different than if you detest it. You can't be around it. You're going you're gonna to throw up if somebody makes you eat it. If it's a survival situation, you're just you're just gonna die rather than eat that food, right? That's that's the test. Jesus goes on and says, The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. Jesus is saying, Boy, a lot of people are now are coming into the kingdom of God. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. But the covenant is changing. The old covenant is being fulfilled and the new covenant, that of the gospel of the kingdom of God. The good news, that's the gospel of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. So Jesus is saying this in following up to the parable. The good news of the kingdom of God is being preached. You can come into the kingdom. God through Jesus is offering forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And then he says, it is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. To say you're still being judged under the law if you haven't entered into the new covenant with God. Of, have, of making Jesus your Lord and Savior and having your sins forgiven. The law wasn't um, wasn't just completely thrown aside. It was fulfilled. But that law is still there, and what we're, our sins are judged for if we're not forgiven. And then Jesus throws in a very hard thing before the next parable, hard to understand, and this this could be its own sermon or theological debate, so I won't spend too long on it. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he's reminding people of their sins and saying that you know, the Bible says that God hates divorce and that marriage is a very, very serious covenant. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, and if she leaves his house and becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes a certificate of divorce and gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then the first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled, and we have we have all these other guidelines in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord, a wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anybody she wishes. 
but he must belong to the Lord, that is, he must be a believer. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God, Paul, living his life. As, as a single there, as a single man, but in Luke's teaching here, in looking at the commentaries, because this is a touchy subject, and it's something that's hard to understand, because Moses and the law of Moses did, Jesus said, pointed out, allowed divorce, permitted it, but he said because, Jesus said it's because of the hardness of your heart, but many commentators, commentaries that I looked at, the commentators had said that here in the book of Luke, in this context, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That's if you're married and you're going after another married woman to say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to marry up. I'm going to marry somebody better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave my wife for this other man's wife, and if I get a quick divorce and remarry, then it won't be adultery. It'll all be legit as far as the Bible and the church. And Jesus is saying, not so. You can't, you can't get out of it in a sense. You can't, um, you can't leave your wife for another woman just because you're going to marry her. It doesn't work that way. Not so simple. Or, or if you're single, you can't marry a married woman and say like, well, that's, that's not really a sin. So it is in that context, but that's, that's a much, much bigger, much bigger topic right there. But back to the dishonest manager, I hope that that just explains, helps to explain a hard passage of scripture to you right there. And I think, I think that documentary I saw kind of explained it very well of what are you in for? Attempted murder? Well, that's, that's respectable. No, of course, it would take a wicked person to say that as all of us in the church are saying, no, of course, trying to murder somebody is not respectable. But the wicked appreciate wickedness. And seeing it, seeing it in that term of we all need to, we all need to use our worldly wealth for godly purposes, and we all, like this manager, need to get our eternal security squared away. As for the dishonest manager, an urgent decision is required. An urgent decision is required. Even the wicked want to live. Even the fly wants to live. Even the hairy spider wants to live. Even the ant wants to live. Jesus is urging us, square, your, square away your eternal life while there is still time. I believe that. And uh, help other people to get it squared away too. Bring your friends. Bring your family. I think, uh, I think when we put it that way, and in the light of Jesus' explanation, it being a very uh, strange illustration, starts to make a lot of sense. And let's end here. And as we do, if you feel that you need to get your spiritual life squared away with God or your eternal security, just like Jesus is talking about in this parable or this story, I just want to invite you to come forward for prayer during this time. Or if you'd like prayer for anything else, I'll be up front during the closing song.
Now we'll highlight a few announcements and then we'll be dismissed. A reminder, you can fill out a connect card in the chair in front of you and put it on the back table to let us know how we could be praying for you or to get on the newsletter list if you're not. Also remember those are always there. You can always do that at the beginning of the service and put it in the offering plate as well. Also remember you can give online by bank bill pay or by mail if you wish. Um, today, um, right after worship, a um, few minutes after we're over, come back in if you're interested or thinking about helping with Vacation Bible School. The theme this year will be Camp Firelight, so it's a camping theme. So we'll uh, tell you a little bit more about Vacation Bible School. We need lots of helpers to be able to pull it off. This, I think this last summer, it took just about every one of us as we had, uh, I think it was 36 kids in total come out for that. And I think our high attendance day was 33 all at once so that's um a lot to manage as they go through different activities but um, the neighborhood kids came kids with no religious affiliation and for some of them that's really their first exposure to hearing the gospel and learning uh, anything about the bible as there are a lot of uh unchurched families in the area. Um, also, we had, I heard we had a good successful women's tea yesterday. Um, so thanks to Lori and the women's ministry for organizing that. Lori asked if there was any able-bodied people available afterwards to be able to take the tables down and put them away that's the round tables that are in the fellowship hall and the chairs that are out if you have a few minutes um, either after service to put them away or after the vbs meeting also saturday may 25th is the men's breakfast at 8 a.m at meridians in sun city so Next thing after that, Saturday, June 1st, there's the downtown Lincoln Car Show, and we're, we'll be meeting for breakfast as a church activity at the Veterans Building at 541 Fifth Street. The Boy Scouts provide a big breakfast 
for eight dollars, which includes pancakes, sausage, eggs, fruit, coffee, and orange juice. And Christopher will be there uh, with his Boy Scout troop helping to serve. Also for the car show, our outreach, our new outreach and evangelism team or committee that is being formed had just met and uh, Leo got a booth rented to pass out information about our church, hold a raffle and pass out vacation Bible school flyers as well as offer prayer to people that are passing by and we need some people to staff that booth. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table. There's also a sign-up sheet for Vacation Bible School that's on the back table now, and that will continue to be on the back table, but we'll go over at the meeting what some of the different areas are to help and the different jobs in which you can serve, and you can sign up today during the meeting, or if you have to think about it or you're not sure if you have those dates open, that'll uh, continue to be on the back table. And there will be a meeting about the outreach to uh, next Sunday after service to go over the final details in regard to having that booth, if you're interested in helping out with that and sticking around for that. Anyway, that's a lot of announcements today. Um, one, one more announcement. I, uh, I lost my car keys. I carried in a bunch of VBS boxes and snow cone cups, and uh, I've been all over the property this morning, and I went to get one more thing out of my car, and it seems that the keys have fallen out of my pocket somewhere. So if you happen to see those, they're, they're mine. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Bob, for praying for that. <laughs> now, uh, let's all rise for the benediction, which is our blessing, and we'll be dismissed. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>